the, ver the first verse starts like this. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers and sisters, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. So you and I, Christian, because we have the Bible and the teaching of the Apostle Paul and the other apostles, we should be very well informed concerning God's timetable and the events leading to the Lord's second coming. You know, the Bible is a book of prophecy. Uh, the first coming of Jesus Christ, uh, the, first, when the birth of Jesus Christ was vastly announced uh, throughout the Old Testament. But this is past for us. So we look behind. It doesn't. We we get to be so familiar with it, though it is the greatest things that ever happened in our lives. This is an uh, an event of the past that continues to have the powerful impact on our lives today, and it continues. That's one of these things that takes place in the past and continue to bless in the future, the coming of Jesus Christ. So there were a lot of prophecies announcing it, but there are also in the same way uh, many prophecies announcing the second coming of Jesus Christ, and this is something that we look up to. This is the prophecies that now we are uh, receiving for ourselves that are warning us, encouraging us, and uh, telling us things so that that we will not be confused like the people here. These people had heard the Apostle Paul speak to them beforehand and telling them the things concerning the Lord's coming. If you read in uh, 1 Thessalonians, you will see that. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. The first letter that he wrote to them, Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers and sisters, you have no need to have anything written to you. Why? Because you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. And then in the first letter, he talks about the raptures and he talks. Every chapter of these letters mention the Lord's coming. First Thessalonians, second Thessalonians. If you want to learn a lot of things about, just read these two letters. You will learn a lot. So this, there is a, a timetable of God. And the purpose of Bible prophecy... It's not for us to try to tick a date and this is the time when Jesus will come. No. The purpose of Bible prophecy is for building character. Amen? It is for building your character. It is to impact your own life, your own living. It is to transform your life. And why do I say that? Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and 3, we have it on the next slide. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. Okay? And may your spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is supposed to produce. The coming of the Lord, the Holy Spirit, you being in tune with that, you waiting and expecting, it will produce that into your life. Character, your conduct, blameless, your mind, your body, you keep yourself pure, you walk in the light. That is what the, the prophecies of the Lord's coming is going to do. Um, Paul emphasized that in both of his letters to the Thessalonians. But some people, they influenced their thinking and got them uh, confused. And they were shaken by this teaching, asking, has God changed his program? Because they had heard Paul speak. They, they have known, said so they are fully aware of the times and seasons. But now it seems that they are confused. So Paul is writing to them not to be quickly shaken or alarmed by words of prophecy. Someone at some in those churches declared something. Maybe they have received a so-called revelation or maybe they are considered as being very spiritual or prophets or something, but they confused the church and contradicted some of the teaching that Paul has already. So he will review this teaching and he will give them some uh, reason why not to be alarmed. The, the day of the Lord is not going to happen until some events are taking place. And that is for us to know uh, this morning. Some events are to take place. 
God has not changed his program. And they had heard the, the, the Apostle Paul say in 1 Thessalonians 1, 10, and chapter 5, verse 9, the purpose of God in his coming, and to wait for his Son, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus who delivers us from what? From the wrath to come. So you and I, because of our faith in Jesus, are not going into the wrath of God like those who do not believe. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9, God has not destined us to wrath, but to obtain salvation. Have you obtained salvation in Christ? Yes, yes so you are not destined to wrath. This is not for you because you have received the love. You have taken the offer of salvation for yourself. So let's go back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. Now concerning the coming of the Lord and our being together with Him in heaven. I have a chart that I want to show you this morning. It's a simple chart because in this chapter we do not have the full picture of all the prophetic uh, events that will take place in what we call the last days in the Bible. But this morning I just want to give you a very, very simple outline that concerns us here this morning. We are now in the church age. And here you see second coming part one because this, this, there is going to be a part two. And it is with the rapture. You find that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Uh, at the voice of the archangel, the trumpet will blow, and the dead in Christ will uh, rise from the dead. And us who are still alive at the time of his coming will be gathered together in the clouds to be with him. For the church is going to be removed from here. The Antichrist is going to be revealed. This is what we are going to, to, to read here this morning. Then there would be the Great Tribulation. You can see that in uh, Revelation chapter 6 to, verse nine, uh, to chapter 19. And then Jesus Christ will come again with the believers. You find that in chapter 19 from verse 11 to 15. You can see that. The Antichrist will be removed, Satan will be bound, the nations will be judged, Jesus Christ will reign on earth for 1,000 years, this we call the millennium. You find all, all of that in the Bible. I'm just going a bit fast here because this is not the purpose of the message this morning. And then after that, the new heaven, the new church, uh, uh, Revelation and uh, Second Peter, the new earth, and Satan will be release Armageddon, Satan removed in the last judgment and eternity. So these are a simple uh, uh, timeline of some of the events that are to come. That's why prophecies is important. We know the calendar of God. We know his timetable. We might not be sure of the which day it is happening, but we know these things are going to come. So you and I, we are going to be part of that either on one side or the other. Everybody is going to be part of that. Either you will be rejoicing for eternity or you will be gnashing teeth for eternity and regretting why not, why, why was I so stupid? And we talked a little bit about that last week. So we want to go back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. And then Paul calmed their hearts and explained why they are not in the day of the Lord already, because some events had to, to come. And he, he says that it is based on some of the teaching that he brought in his first letter. The rapture first must come. Before the day of the Lord, the, the, the man of, uh, of sin will come, the rapture must happen first. This is what he says, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering with him. This is the first thing that will uh, take place. And just to give you a definition, the day of the Lord uh, is the period of time that will follow the rapture. Okay, that's what comes after the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is not a day of rejoicing. It's a day of judgment. It's a day of darkness. It's a day when Satan will be working uh, horribly in this world and God will be sending his righteous judgment against ungodliness and wickedness and all of this, the evil that will be released when the man of sin, the, 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 the lawless one comes. We have no idea 
how evil this time will be. You know, sometimes we look at the headlines and we hear horrible things. We look at the program on TV and we look at all the sinfulness in this society and we think that cannot go worse. Well, be surprised because this is nothing compared to when the lawless one will be, will be released in this world. So there will be a time of judgment. Then Paul, in verse 3, continues to explain why they could not be in the day of the Lord yet, because other events are coming. And one of the first events, he calls it the falling away, the apostasy. Uh, some says here the rebellion or the revolt or something like that. But the word used in the Bible is the word apostasy. You know, in the, in the world history, there were other apostasies, major apostasies. One of them that we all have heard about in history is the Dark Ages. The Dark Ages is one of the greatest apostasy of all time. It's when there was no more word of God. At one point, there were three popes fighting against one another. The people were being burned. You know, if they had uh, some kind of faith, they would be burned and all of this. There would be horrible time. It was a time of darkness completely. And that's when the Reformation came, right after that. And the, some of the writers of the Bibles and the translation of the Bible translated the Bibles. And they were put to death because of that. That was an apostasy. But there is another apostasy, and it is going to be the greatest apostasy that the world will ever have experienced. So the Dark Ages is nothing compared to the apostasy that is coming here. What is an apostasy? An apostasy is when the, the living by faith, the love for God, the, the, the fire for uh, following Jesus is dying away. It's like a distancing uh, from the faith, a turning away and a forsaking of. And this happens to Christians also. Unfortunately, I'm sad to say that, but it, it, it has happened. That is what apostasy is. Apostasy means away from something that you already had. You had a faith, and now you don't have it anymore. You are forsaken it. This is an apostasy. So that means that to have an apostasy, you have to first, think for a moment, you have first to have believers, people who had a faith, okay? And now they don't have it. They reject it. They contradict it. They are rebelling against it. So that's why the word rebellious is. So if Christian turn away from the faith, what will be the condition of the others in the world? And sometimes it is very subtle because, you know, we have to be careful because a, a form of a lighter level of apostasy can be in our heart, even now. A losing interest in, uh, being attracted by the things of the world more than the things of this, uh, you know, like the compromise that we make. It's like a moving toward it. You know, it's, it's a form of apostasy, or at least it is steps toward the apostasy. And it is happening. There's a lot of people in this world who go to church, but the heart is not there. And it's not new. It was in the Old Testament. Jesus says, their lips proclaim me, but their heart is far away from me. That is an, an apostasy also. So let us be very careful and to keep the fire always burning. That's why Paul says, restore the first love. Restore the first love. As soon as you become aware that your first love is dying away, that you are losing interest, that the things of the world has more importance to you than the the, the things of God, it's a warning. Be careful, this is a form of apostasy. And there will be a, a world apostasy. So you can imagine the state of churches. There will be churches. And the churches will be singing the song. Uh, but will they have a heart? There will be Christian concert, but will, will there be a heart? You know, let, let us be careful about, about all of this. The second thing is that a great political leader will arise. And this is what we see here. And he is called by various names. You know, only John, the Apostle John, calls him the Antichrist. Paul doesn't call him the Antichrist. He calls him the man of sin, 
the son of perdition and the lawless one. That's how he calls him in this chapter here. And this is a characterization of his character. What kind of person, what will be his, his doing in all of this? Sin and rebellion will be his trademark. And here when it says the lawless one, uh, and the dictionary says not only it is a disobedience, or a mistake that he does, but it is a, a flagrant defiance of the known will of God. This one will be defying God with everything that he has. This is when he, he will come, the son of perdition. And the son of perdition tells us something also more about him. It tells us how his end will be. He is the son of perdition. He will be destroyed. He is doomed because of, of course, he is the enemy of God. So God will judge him and he is, he is lost. But the, the sad things or the tragedy with that is that he will bring many with him. It's not only him that will be the son of the... So verse 5. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And you know what is restraining him. Now, so that he may be revealed in his time, for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he is out of the way. Okay, two things to observe there. I told you, and you know that. Okay, so that's something that the Thessalonians have heard from Paul. It is not mentioned what, but we know that Paul says, I told you these things and you know these things. You know what? You know what is restraining him. Why is the man of lawlessness not yet here? Why not yet? Satan wants him here right now. He wanted him a long time ago in the world, but he is not permitted yet. Why? Because something he is restraining him. We don't have a, a clear descriptions in the Bible, so we can only assume what is the he that is restraining him. And this, the thing that here also we need to, to uh, observe is that we forget too easily and we need to constantly be reminded of this great truth. Because you see, these people that heard Paul, I told you, and you, you know, but he's still you know, hammering it to them. He's still repeating and he's still exhorting. He's still putting it in front of them because they need to be refreshed. They need to be clear on that. They need to know what is going to happen. And so do we here in Lighthouse uh, this morning. So we have a few questions in this chapter. What is the apostasy? Who is the man of sin? And who is the restrainer? The restrainer, according to the most popular uh, accepted uh, theological view of that, is that it is the Holy Spirit indwelling the church, the believers, that we are the salt of the earth, we are the light of the world, and salt prevent corruptions. And until there will be a church in this world, the man of sin cannot be revealed. He cannot come fully to, 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 to the world and do the, 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 the program that Satan has, the mystery of iniquity. It's not going to be fulfilled until he who restrain him is here. And he who is restraining is sitting here in this room. <laughs> Amen. Take a mirror and look at in it and you will see who is restraining him. It is the Holy Spirit in you and the church worldwide. Can you imagine, you know, look at just in Hong Kong for a moment, just like a quick uh, ideas. There are many s strong Christians in the high level of the Hong Kong government here. We still have an uh, openness to Christianity. Uh, the government still gives subsidies to religious organizations for charities and for building schools and hospitals. There is still something positive here. When a law will come for injustice, we have people representing the refugees, we have people representing the orphans and the poverty, we have the Hong Kong Church Network for the Poor, uh, Christian Solidarity, you have Christian Actions, you have uh, all sorts of, you have Wuoi Christian uh, Rehab, you have a lot of organizations all over the world who are 
uh, restraining evil, uh, um, bringing back the, the darkness to light, restoring people who have been destroyed by sin. Uh, you know, like it, it's happening in this world. Take it away. Take it away. What's going to happen? So, I have a small exhortation for you this morning. Never underestimate the importance of the church and this world. You know, sometimes we look at, you know, we make a lot of mistakes in the church. We have a lot of imperfect person, me first, you know. Uh, we, we do things that we regret, we say things that we regret, and sometimes we may even uh, look at our weaknesses and the failure of the church and many instances of the church, but never the less, never underestimate the importance of the church and this world because the church is part of God's program and the timetable of God is going to be fulfilled because the church is still part of his program and we are still the voice of God and we are still a witness and we are still the light and we are still the salt and we are still saying no to certain things and we are still, you know, people in the church, the church is functional and the church is there. The church is every place in the world. You know, it, it is a witness. It's, it's living. Amen? Amen? So look at yourself and uh, tap yourself on the shoulder or do something, but be proud to be part of God's, of God's program this morning. People who criticize the church do not realize the uh, presence of the people of God in this world, what it does. It gives the unsaved the opportunity to be saved. Just that alone is big. Who is giving the unsaved an opportunity to be saved, except the church. You're the only voice. You're the only promoters, the proclaimers of the gospel, the herald of the gospel all over the world in evangelism and in mission. We are doing that. We have to, at least we should be doing that. So that's one thing that the church... Number two, the church ensures that everything is kept on God's schedule. The man of sin is not going to come before the, the one who restrained him is taken away, and that is at the rapture, okay? And, and the presence of the church in this world is delaying God's judgment because after the church goes, God's judgment comes because darkness will be all over the world. It, it, violence will be all over the world. There will be nothing to restrain evil, and we have no idea how, how the degree of evil and wickedness that will be filling the, 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 the streets uh, of, of all nations in this world. The, the war and the rumors of wars and the hatred and the violence and all of this. So God, uh, we have two programs in this world. Either you are in one program or the other one. God's program or Satan, the mystery of iniquity. And, and nothing will change this program. Verse 8, and then the lawless one will be revealed only then when the rapture takes place whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming the coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan and with all power and false signs and wonders and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing the lawless one will be revealed in this world. I have a small PowerPoint. I just want to impress your mind with pictures as the pictures will uh, speak more than, than a thousand words. These, these pictures, you are going to, to see these things over, over and over on the news and everything. The, 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 the four horsemen of the apocalypse, the fall of the kingdom of this world, the 666, the rebellious, and the violence in the streets of all nations. Government will not know how to. And the, the Israel and uh, all the, the things that are going to happen. And the persecutions and the, the dollar and all of these things. This is all going to, to happen. So this is, we're going worse. We're going worse and we're going worse. Let's continue to verse, uh, verse 8. Paul here sh talks very briefly of the coming of the man of sin. He does not tell us everything that he's doing in that chapter. He says, he's coming, and when Jesus comes, 
is going to <laughs> remove him. So remember on the chart that I have shown you at first, there was a first part in the Lord's coming, that's the rapture, and another part when Jesus comes for judgment in Revelation chapter 19. So now we are talking when Jesus comes in this one. Second Thessalonians chapter 1 is talking about that. Uh, Revelation chapter 19 talks about this. When he comes with the breath of his mouth, he will kill him and put him to nothing in this time. So this is a powerful manifestation. Nobody else would be able to stop the Antichrist because he is energized by Satan. He is put there by the power of deceptions, the, the f lying miracles and all of this. There will be power there. There will be things to, to make people believe and follow and worship and accept everything. And nobody will be able to make a stop to that except when Jesus comes. He is the one. So you are on the right side. He, the power of God is telling you don't fear anything, follow, keep on, uh, because Jesus Christ and his calendar is going to settle, he's going to, 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 to put him, you know, and, and bind him for 1,000 years, and he's going to be thrown away in the lake of fire for eternity. All of these things are going to happen. But I want you to pay attention to all various kinds of miracles and signs and lying wonders or false wonders with all wicked deception. I don't know how this will be exactly in terms of actual events and presentation, but it's going to be bad. <laughs> it's going to be bad. And there's a difference between the miracles of the Lord. The miracles of the Lord were always proving the prophecies. They were proving the coming of Jesus Christ as a savior. They were fulfilling the miracles of Jesus were moral in nature. The miracle of Jesus Christ would lead people to the truth and to save them, to bring them to eternity. The miracles of the Antichrist are lying wonders. And I have no idea how it will be, but he would use every form of wickedness. And then we talk that he will use, verse 10 to 12, all the wicked deception for those who are perishing. M my point here when I was reading this text, I think it is very tragic that Jesus Christ has been announced in prophecies. He has come into this world. He has achieved and completed the salvation for all mankind. It's done. The offer of salvation has been for all people, but here we read that people are perishing. They should not be perishing. They should be saved because Jesus has come. But you know what? They proclaim themselves atheists. They refused to believe in Jesus Christ. It doesn't make sense. The Virgin Mary, uh, Jesus Christ, God become a man, the cross, the blood, the resurrection. It doesn't make sense. I don't want to. I prefer to believe uh, uh, Buddhism. I prefer Zen, meditation, yoga. I prefer uh, something else, anything. Uh, I have my own belief. Uh, uh, this is too, uh, you know, uh, only the weak believe. You know, things like that. So whatever arguments that these people have, they refuse to believe the truth. What do they believe now? They believe a lie. To me, that is the most astounding thing. Like, I proclaim myself an unbeliever, okay? What are you doing and believing now? You are not an unbeliever anymore. You are believing. That is what is going to happen in this world. You, and to everybody that rejects faith in Jesus Christ. You, my mind, I am a logical man, a man of science. I cannot believe in Jesus Christ. You will be a believer in the false miracles. That is what is going to happen. Deceived by a powerful delusion. Verse 13. But we ought always to give thanks for you. Now, in the 12 first chapters, it was a summary 
that he gave us concerning the events leading to uh, the day of the Lord, specifically, specifically looking at the coming of the lawless one. But now, in contrast, he describes the calling and the future, your calling and your future. Amen? Amen. Now he's talking to you, okay? Now he's, he, 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 he calmed the confusion. He settled all of this. He make it all clear in terms of calendar and what's happening and why it's not happening now. So be at peace. But for you, look what your future is going to be like. So he's going to give like a mini system of theology in verse 13 and 14. The scope of God's purposes. And you will see the past, the present, and the future in this verse. The past, God chose you. He called you. God is so good. He, he made a method to save all men. Because in fact, all of us should be condemned. But God is merciful and he has taken upon his heart to, to have a method, a plan, that people could be saved. So he calls them, and what calls them is the gospel message, the good news, what Jesus is and what he has done. Now it is up to us to, to respond. We are called. This is the mercy of God. God has a right to choose to save people who work on them, and that is what he is do, doing here. Through the sanctification of the Spirit, now we see pre-conversion, work of the Holy Spirit, and after conversion, before you were saved, you needed the working of the Holy Spirit to lead you, to convince you, to, to touch your heart, to, to open your eyes to Jesus Christ so that you would believe in Jesus. You needed the Holy Spirit before you were converted. And your whole conversion process is being born again is by the Holy Spirit. What about now? Your sanctification, the transformation, you're walking in the light, you're, you're becoming a different person like Jesus, pleasing to the Lord in all of this. This is the work of the Holy Spirit in you. Amen? Yeah. So that's present. And look at the last part of the message. So that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is your future. This is where you're going. Uh, this is what's going to happen to you. Verse 15. So then, we are concluding this morning. So then, what, what do you need to do? So then, stand firm and hold on to the traditions that you were taught by us. Okay, the word tradition here doesn't mean like uh, traditions of man. Uh, you know that. It is, the word tradition is a very old word that means something that has been transmitted, handed over, and entrusted to you by the apostles, either by word directly to them or by their writing. So when it says traditions, we're not talking the traditions of the Pharisees, we're not tra talking the traditions of men, we're talking the traditions of the Word of God, the true, inspired, uh, revealed, truth, living Word of God. That's the only thing. Stand firm, hold on, okay, on the Word. Because the word is the one that gives you this calendar. It tells you what your future is going to be like. It tells you the events that are coming. You don't have to be confused. You don't have to be fearful. You just have to hold on and believe. Continue to follow what you have received and, and, and the Bible. And you will, be, you will be okay. You know, just like every Christian all over the world, all of us will be tempted, are tempted, and will be tempted to waver from the truth and leave the faith. That's why Paul p talks about apostasy. So how can you avoid that? How can you make sure you will be standing firm and not ashamed at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ? To be blameless and a person of character for God. And someone that the Holy Spirit living in you has been using to uh, retain evil from this world and all of this. Is, is, this is because you are standing firm and holding. Also about prophecy. Why should you be um, paying attention to the prophecies? There are two, two, two more reasons, and I'm closing with that. will not be long. 2 Peter 1.19 We have the prophetic word more fully confirmed 
to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in the dark place until the day dawns in the morning. So you have, you do well to pay attention to the words of prophecy like what you have heard this morning. You do well if you pay attention to that because this word will be like a, a, a lamp shining in dark places. You see clearly the way. Because when, when you are confused, you don't know. It's like darkness. You don't know how to make the right decisions and how to stand firm and how to resist and all this. But the word of prophecy is clarifying it. It gives you a hope. It gives you an assurance. You know what's going to happen. Jesus Christ declared it. And the other purpose is found in the last verse of this chapter we are looking at this morning, verse 16. It is kind of a blessing that Paul is giving to them, but there is a, a big truth in, in this one. Uh, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope. The word comfort is the word paraclesis. It's like encouragement, exhortation, uh, admonishing. So the word of prophecy that you have heard this morning in 2 Thessalonians gives us an eternal exhortation, eternal encouragement, an eternal comfort. We're not worried, we're not afraid, we're not uh, alarmed, we are secure because we know in whom we have believed. Amen? Amen? And then it says, verse 17, comfort your hearts and establish your heart. How can you be establishing your heart if you're not sure of anything? If you don't have a, a, a rock under your feet, if you don't have a, a Savior, a Lord, that is telling the truth, that is reliable, trustworthy, He is the truth. When you have that, you can establish your heart. Nothing will move you. Amen? Amen. And that's why prophecy is important. So that's this morning as we approach the Advent, and we are looking at Jesus Christ coming for the first time. And so many prophecies were announcing Him in the same way. When Jesus was going to be born, remember Simeon, Anna, and others, it says of them that they were waiting for the consolation of Israel. Are we waiting for our own consolation? And you know the word consolation is the same word, paraclesis, the paraclesis of Israel, the encouragement, the comfort, the consolation of Israel. Are we waiting for them? You know, Paul, many, many times, describe the church as a people waiting for Christ. That's how he describes us. And we have many scriptures about that. He is coming. He is coming for us. He is coming for you. And this is a sure thing. So establish your heart. Be comforted. Don't be confused. And prepare yourself in the sermon. As we are preparing for Christmas that is already past, it's kind of a celebration looking back. Now we have another one. The prophecies that have been fulfilled in the first coming of Jesus Christ assure us that the prophecies that are yet to be fulfilled are going to be fulfilled. They come from the same source. The source of, your, your, of the prophecy, the source of the traditions that we have to stand firm and keep. The source. What's the source? Amen? Let's stand together this morning. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. God is so good. Hallelujah. 